up a sound of worship that gets God's attention. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just because it's Sunday doesn't mean my worship changes. And if it does change, it's greater. Hey, I give you a greater worship tonight than I did on yesterday. Because he's an awesome God and he deserves all of our praise, all of our worship. Come on, lift up a sound in the room. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. We bless him tonight. We worship him tonight. He's an awesome God. He's an awesome Savior. We clap our hands in his presence. Come on, we clap our hands in his presence. And while our hands are clapping, we're giving him reverence. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Yes, God. That's it, church. Yes, yes, that's the sound that he's waiting on tonight. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Yes, God, yes, God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout in the atmosphere and say, Jesus reigns. Come on, shout it again. Say, Jesus reigns. Now, if you're excited about it, put your hands together real good. Come on. Hallelujah, he reigns tonight, he reigns. We're celebrating Jesus.
Come on, that's not good enough. If you know Jesus reigns tonight, can you lift up your worship and your praise like you know he reigns? I'm not thinking about it. I know he reigns. Look at somebody and say, I'm not thinking about it. I know he reigns. So since you know he reigns, why don't you take 30 seconds and lift up your worship tonight? How about Shia? Come on, don't waste this time. Somebody open up your word. Open up your mouth and give him your worship. Glory to God. Can we just lift up our hands? And can everybody under the sound of my voice use this moment to use your voice. Use your voice in this moment. And I want you to love on Jesus. Come on. Come on, raise up your worship. Those of you that are watching at home on your iPad, on your cell phone, why don't you lift up worship wherever you are? Come on, we're going to make this a, a Bethel, a house of worship, a house of prayer, house of praise tonight. We lift up our worship, Jesus. Come on, I will exalt you, Jesus. I will exalt you. Hallelujah. I will exalt you. You are my God. Can we make it personal now? Let's just raise our worship saying. I will exalt you. Everybody raise his hand. I will exalt you. Come on, everybody say it. I will exalt you. Tell them tonight, tell them, you are my God. You are my God. Can we have the sound of one in the room? Everybody say, I will. Come on, raise it. Say, I will exalt you. Use your voice and tell them tonight. Glory to God. Everybody lift it, say, yeah. Let's all worship together. Let's all say it together. Let's say it, say it. You are my God. My hiding place, my safe. Come on, everybody, raise it, say it. You're my hiding place. Say it. My safe Everybody say it. My treasure, Lord, you. Anointed one, Anointed most holy. Come on, everybody, say my hiding place. My hiding place. I'm safe in your arms, Jesus. Safe with you. My treasure, Lord, you my are. My treasure, Lord, you are. Glory to God. You're my friend and my, my king. king. I need everybody to raise the same. Tell him, tell him, tell him. You are my God. Come on, one more time, everybody. Say, I will. I will exalt you. Why don't you throw your hands way up in the air? I will exalt you. And use your voice like an arrow. Say it, say it. I will exalt you. You are my You're with me, say it, say it. Because you're with me. You'll never leave me alone, because Jesus. You're, with me. you're always with us, Jesus. Because A very present help. I don't have to be a say it, say it. I will not be. He's a very present of because you're with me. Because you're 
So, Father, we just come to thank you right now. Father, we just come to thank you right now because you are our God. You reign above all, and we declare your name to be great, to be above all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We exalt your name, Lord God. We lift you high. You are mighty, Lord God. We just thank you right now for bringing us together, Lord God, to worship you, to give your name praise. Hallelujah. 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 The angels declare that you are great. You are God. And we stand here today together united as one to send you praise. We ask that you stand by us. We ask that you be with us in this moment right now, Lord God. We declare your name to be great. 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 Cover us in this moment, Lord God. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening, New Birth family. Thank you for joining us tonight. I believe that it's important that we love on the people that surround us, whether it's a friend, a family member, or someone we don't know. So I ask that you give a warm hug to the person on your left, your right, behind you, or in front of you. It's time to pass the peace, new birth. and tell them I'm so glad you're sitting next to me. Yes, yes. If you're watching tonight by live stream, we're so glad you're sitting with us. Thank you for worshiping here at New Birth. We didn't have to wait till Sunday morning to get back together. Aren't you glad the Lord said on Tuesday night, let's come back together. He couldn't wait to meet us. He couldn't wait a whole two days. And he said, I want to see my children again. And here we are in the Lord's presence in the house of the Lord. So good to see you all tonight, New Birth. Do you know what today is? Do you know what happened on May 21st? Do you know what day we're celebrating? Are you aware of who we're celebrating today? Well, if you don't know, let me tell you, today is our pastor's birthday. Happy birthday, Dr. Bryant. Come on, let's give him a new birth celebration. Hallelujah, it does matter that you were born and we're so glad that you were born on this day and we can celebrate you in Jesus' name. 
Well, at New Birth, staff has a policy that you get your birthday off. It is an actual leave day that, that we can take birthday leave. And so today our pastor is celebrating his birthday and he's not here. We pray he is having a blast, having a ball. Just have fun. Do what you want to do. It's your birthday. And we're so glad that we could celebrate you on Sunday, and we'll continue to celebrate you. I celebrate the whole month. I don't know about y'all, so I think he needs to at least celebrate the rest of this month and maybe on into next month, too. How about that? Amen. Well, on tonight, we are not left uncovered. He has blessed us with a gift. Although it is Dr. Bryant's birthday, he has given new birth a gift, and he's given us the gift of sending Bishop Van Moody our way to preach the gospel to us tonight. And let me tell you, it's a great, great gift. We're going to receive the man of God, but I want to give him a proper introduction. In case you've never heard him or never heard of him, you are in for a treat. This is a mighty man of God. Bishop Van Moody has a passion for transforming people, organizations, and the world. His background in leadership, business, and ministry has taken him from TED Talks to the Tom Joyner Morning Show, from the platform of the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington to the Pontifical Council in Rome with Pope John Paul II. He has spoken in Tokyo as an associate trainer for Dr. John Maxwell's Equip Leadership Organization in Melbourne for Planet Shakers, and as a keynote speaker for Bishop T.D. Jake's Women Thou Art Loosed Conference. Since 2016, Bishop Moody has been a member of Dr. Oz's core team and has been featured several times on the Dr. Oz Show on ABC. He writes frequently for the Christian Post and Fox News, and his articles have been featured in Essence Magazine, Investors Business Daily, Forbes, and many, many others. He's the author of not one, two, three, four, but five books, three of which have been bestsellers. Yes, The People Factor, The I Factor, and his latest book, Desired by God. Bishop Moody also assists in leading the Macedonia International Bible Fellowship, a global network of pastors and churches. He was recently consecrated to the sacred office of bishop in the Lord's Church to serve as the assistant to the presiding bishop, Dr. Kenneth C. Ulmer. Praise the Lord. Bless God for his elevation. Amen. Amen. He doesn't come to us as a stranger. He is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, he's come home tonight. And he is a graduate of DePaul University, the Interdenominational Theological Center, Harvard University's Summer Leadership Institute. And he has participated for several years in the continuing education summer session led by Dr. Ulmer at Oxford University in Oxford, England. He's currently pursuing his second doctoral degree at Biola University in California. In March of 2006, Bishop Moody established the Worship Center Christian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And this thriving church serves more than 5,000 members in three locations with five weekly services and an active international online campus. Would you please stand with me tonight because we are about to be fed the word of God, served by one who is an expert in serving up what God has for us tonight. The bread of life is about to come, but not just manna. We declare meat, for we are ready to receive of the richness from the table of the Lord. We are extremely pleased tonight to welcome Bishop Dr. Van Moody and his lovely wife, Dr. Ty, to new birth. Please give them a new birth welcome. Let's receive Bishop Van Moody as he comes to deliver God's word. Come on, new birth. God bless you, new birth. Standing, why don't you um, reach out across the aisles, if you don't mind, to grab the hand of someone next to you as we go to God in prayer. 
Our Father and our God, we are so grateful for your loving kindness and your grace that we don't deserve, but you continue to lavish upon us. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for giving us this day, and not just this day, but our daily bread. So, Father, we've gathered in your holy sanctuary on tonight, desiring to hear from you. So, Lord, speak to us. Remove every distraction, anything that seeks to divert our attention away from you and speak, Lord. Father, I pray that you would set us on fire. Cultivate a hunger for you and you alone. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. And those who agree, say amen. 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 Would you give God praise as you take your seats? <laughs> Let me echo uh, the sentiments that have already gone forth. Uh, I honor uh, your esteemed Pastor Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant, would you help me praise God for him and happy birthday uh, to him. I was reflecting uh, as my wife and I were driving uh, here today, um, I met uh, Dr. Bryant uh, when he was a freshman at Morehouse and I was a senior at Douglas High School uh, and it's amazing just to see how God uh, continues to order his steps. And so I join in with a host of people around the world celebrating uh, not only him, but in particular this new season uh, of this magnificent journey, new birth that God has had you on. And I believe that the best is still yet to come. Amen. And while I stand here, I also honor the life and legacy of uh, Bishop Eddie L. Long. We praise God for him. Amen. Amen. I had the great opportunity to know him and uh, he has been a tremendous blessing to my life and his legacy remains a blessing uh, to my life and uh, the friendship uh, that uh, he has with my pastor Dr. Kenneth C. Omer remains a model uh, and something that I admire greatly. I am under assignment tonight from your pastor. He called me, uh, shared with me that it was his birthday and, and wanted to take a breather and uh, asked me if I could stand tonight for him and he shared with me the series of teaching that you are in and he asked me to teach something about prayer and hearing from God. Uh, so this is Bible study, and I trust that you've come to study the Bible. Uh, and so if so, uh, there's a lot that I want to download into your hearts and spirit tonight that I believe is uh, from God and for you in this time and in this series. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6. And I just want to read it and jump right to it. And uh, I believe the media team will have uh, notes and things of that nature. I want to talk tonight uh, from this topic, how hungry are you? Look at someone around you and ask them that question. How hungry are you? I'm not talking about food and dinner and chicken. I'm talking about something greater than that. How hungry are you? Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5 the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are the longest sermon that Jesus gives during his earthly ministry. And the Beatitudes are important because in it, Jesus is laying out, if you will, the rules for the kingdom of God. He's giving fresh insight at the top of his earthly ministry about what it means to be a kingdom citizen and how the kingdom of God operates. So often when Jesus would preach, he would preach talking about the kingdom of God is at hand. But in the Beatitudes, he begins to unpack what that means as it relates to our practical daily living. 
And in Matthew 5 and verse 6, he gives one of those kingdom principles where he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be, some translations say, they shall be filled. It is this verse that we want to focus on tonight um, as our main verse because in it, Jesus is telling us a lot about uh, the subject of prayer and even hearing from God. The main principle that I want you to understand tonight um, as we study scripture on this topic is this principle that Jesus is teaching here in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and 6. And here is the principle. God is attracted to people who hunger for him. This is an important principle, and I want you to get it. If you're taking notes, write this down. God is attracted to people who hunger for him. This is why God cannot resist people who humbly and honestly seek him and demonstrate that they desperately need him. There is a famous football play called uh, the Hail Mary. And uh, the Hail Mary is a famous football play and many people have forgotten or perhaps do not know that that play, the Hail Mary, is actually named after a Catholic prayer. Uh, The Hail Mary is when the football team has done everything that they can do and uh, the clock is winding down. There are very few seconds left in the game. And uh, the only thing left for them to do is to send everybody down into the end zone and to throw the ball into the end zone with the hope and desire that someone from their team will catch it and come down in the end zone. That's called a Hail Mary. Uh, Unfortunately, though, that's how people, a lot of people, treat prayer. Meaning that we will do a number of things in our own power and when we exhaust everything that we know to do, then as a last ditch effort, last resort kind of effort, then we pray, we throw up a Hail Mary, God please. And what I want you to understand is if that is your posture of prayer, that says to God that you don't really hunger for him. Psychologists and therapists will acknowledge on a variety of levels that any relationship will succeed or fail based on the level of communication. Think about this with me. My wife is here with me tonight. What kind of marriage would we have if we only communicated once a week? Uh, It wouldn't be the kind of marriage that it is. I'm blessed to have a great marriage, but it would not be so if I only communicated with my wife once a week and maybe for a couple of minutes uh, that week. If you think about our posture as it relates to going to church for uh, 90 minutes, uh, two hours or two hours and a half, sometimes that is the only moment in the full seven days of a week that we set aside time to talk to God. And what I want you to understand is that that kind of posture suggests that, God, I don't really hunger for you. This is why I want you to understand tonight that time with God through prayer is so important. I applaud your illustrious pastor for even teaching this because it appears nowadays that Uh, This subject is one of those kind of subjects that very few people are even interested in, yet at the same time, we wonder why there is so little power in our lives, why there's so little manifestation of God's presence in our jobs, on our homes, and in our families. It's because we don't pray. But here's what I want you to understand. Prayer can't just be taught by principle. Prayer has to be born out of a desire and a need. Prayer is not about routine. Prayer is not even really about formula. At its most basic level, prayer is about need. It's about honestly communicating with God that I need you that I am desperate for you, that I cannot move, I cannot work, I cannot function without you. 
And, and so the first main point that I want you to understand tonight, if you're taking notes, we are in Bible study, aren't we? It is this, number one, prayer is what God desires and responds to. I want you to get this. Prayer is what God desires and responds to. So, so, so let's do a little bit of a Bible study and let's drop anchor here and do some work. In order for you to really understand the power of prayer, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning, to the very first mention of prayer in the Bible. So I'm talking about Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse 25. It says, Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Watch this. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. Here it is. At that time, people began to what? Call on the name of the Lord. I want you to think about this for a moment. Up until this point, people had only known God as a creator. He made the world, he made the Garden of Eden, he made, he made everything else. But the Bible says in Genesis 4 that at that moment, people began to pray. They literally began to call on the name of the Lord. I want you to get this, and so I'm taking my time. I don't want to move too fast right up and through here. I want you to see that before there was even a Bible, before the first preacher was ordained, before the first choir performed uh, in, in ministry of song, I want you to know that before all of that, people began to call on the name of the Lord. In fact, the name for God's people in the very beginning were not Jews, it was not the nation of Israel. It was not even Hebrews. In the very beginning, the original name for God's people was those who call on the name of the Lord. Can, can you imagine the conversation that a couple of ladies had back then? Girl, have you heard that God answers you when you call him? He's so much more than just a creator. He, he responds to our needs. I, I imagine the other one saying, well, what are you talking about? That can't be true. God is the creator. Yes, yes, yes. He is the creator, but he's also more than that. Get this. When you call him, he listens, he responds, and he acts. See, I, I want you to understand. I want you to understand that prayer is communication with God. And the reason that God responds when we pray is because we were created in the very beginning to have communion with Him. That's what Adam and Eve had in the garden before, before Satan slithered in and, and tempted them. They had unfettered, unrestricted access to God and a part of their purpose was to commune with God on a daily basis, on a constant, frequent basis. We were created to have communion with him. But another reason why God responds to prayer is because prayer says to God that we are dependent on him. See, anything that you don't pray about, you are literally saying to God, I don't need your help with this. That's so good, I got to say that again. Teach, Bishop, I am. Anything that you don't pray about, you are literally telling God, I, I, don't, I don't need your help with this. This is what the Bible means when it uses the phrase, they called on the Lord. All through the Old Testament, you see that phrase over and over and over again. They called on the name of the Lord. They called on the name of the Lord. They called on the name of the Lord. And when they, when, when they called, when you see that phrase in the Bible, it literally means to cry out, to implore aid. That's what real prayer is is about that's the kind of prayer that literally touches the heart of God a few years ago my wife and I got a puppy for our kids and we were in the process of trying to make sure that our puppy he's a golden doodle and we named him Teddy he looks like a teddy bear and 
we were trying to make sure that Teddy was, was, was house trained. We, we couldn't have a dog messing up the house and making a mess. And so uh, the focus when we first got Teddy as a puppy was to make sure that he was house trained. And when we were house training him, puppy training him, I, I learned something that, that when he's okay, he won't say anything. When he doesn't need anything, he won't say anything. But the moment that he needs us, he, he begins to, he, he begins to whimper. He begins to make noise. He even will, will cry out. And when I, we hear him crying, when we hear him whimpering, that's the signal that he needs us. That's the signal that we've got to turn our attention in his direction and see to his need. That's what prayer does for the heart of God. A great theologian once said that the best style of prayer is that which cannot be called anything else but a cry. This is what God invites us to do all through the Bible. Passages like Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 where he says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things. Some translations say mighty things that you know not of. I want you to get this, New Birth, tonight. God is not aloof. He is not disconnected. He is not up in heaven twiddling his thumbs. He has said from the very beginning, I will help you if you call me. When you don't know what to do, call me. When, when you don't know which way to turn, call me. When all hell is breaking loose, call me. When you feel like you still got things under control, call me. When you're ready to throw in the towel, call me. This is why even in Deuteronomy 4, Moses says this in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 7. He says, what are the nation, get this, what, what are the nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us when? Whenever we pray. I love it. God, I love your word. Moses is saying, listen, the other nations might have better weapons. <laughs> the other nations might have better swords and spears. They might even have better chariots, but they don't got what we got. It's bad, it's bad English, but it's good theology. He's saying they don't have what we have. What we have is we know that when we call on the name of the Lord, he's going to respond and he's going to help. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, I, I want you to know, I want you to, I want you to understand th that prayer is the energy, it's the fuel of a believer's life. Prayer is our lifeline. W without prayer in your life, it's kind of like having a baby in your arms that's dressed up and looking cute, but the baby's not breathing. And unfortunately, so many of us are dressed up and we look cute, but we're dead and dying. Because we don't pray. There is no power unless we pray. Don't get me wrong, teaching is good. But there's no power unless we pray. Please don't misunderstand. Great praise and worship is significant, but there is no power unless we pray. Please, please understand, I'm not hating against good preaching. Good preaching is great, but there is no power unless we pray. Satan's main strategy from the very beginning has been to try to convince us to not talk to God. Think about what he did with Adam and Eve. Well, God's hiding something from you. You don't have to worry about that. Just listen to what I'm trying to tell you. He's literally trying to silence their communication with God. He tries to do the same thing with us. He will, he will literally whisper to you, you, you don't need to pray about that. You don't need to call on God about that. You, you know what to do. You've got enough degrees. You've been to some uh, elite schools. You're gifted. You're talented. You're anointed. You're clever. You can figure this out. See, the enemy doesn't want us to pray because the enemy knows that when we pray, his kingdom begins to crumble. 
The enemy knows that when we pray, the demonic strongholds where he's been hiding are exposed. The, the enemy knows that when we pray, we begin to do damage, horrific damage to his kingdom when we lift our hearts to our Father and begin to pray. Part of the reason that David was a man after God's own heart was because David's whole posture was that he wanted to call on the name of the Lord. Look at Psalm 4 and verse 3. He says, know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call him. He says, the Lord hears me when I pray. And I love this because David writes this psalm while he's literally preparing for battle with the Philistines. And what he's saying is it doesn't matter how large their army is. It doesn't matter how skilled their warriors are. What I know is that God hears me when I pray. This is pro probably what he was thinking about when he ran into battle with Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He doesn't have direct access to the Father like I have. Let me share this with you because I want you to get this. Y'all still following me? Prayer is so significant. Prayer is so important. This notion of calling on God is so critical that I want to show you how God defines wicked people in Psalm 14. In Psalm 14 and verse 4, it says this, Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. And look at this, they never what? Look at how God defines wicked people. He, he says, part of what I see as a wicked person is somebody that doesn't call on the name of the Lord. The main thing God wants is our attention. New birth, he wants our focus to be on him. And that is what prayer does. And he says it over and over and over again. Scriptures like Acts 2 and verse 21 that says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, a lot of times we think that verses like that are only for eternal salvation. It's not just about being saved eternally. It's also about being saved presently. God is literally saying, if you call on me, I'll save your marriage. If you call on me, I'll save your finances. If you call on me, I'll save your children from going down roads. You know they got no business going down. If you call on me, I'll save that job and save your purpose and save your destiny. In fact, in Psalm 50, Verse 15, God says this, he says, watch this, call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Watch this, and you will what? That's so good. I, I got to read that again and make sure you didn't miss the place to shout. You really did. God says, call on me in the day of trouble. He says, and I will deliver you. And we shout about that, but we miss. He says, and you will honor me. Sometimes we think that, that honoring God is just about praise and worship. Give him honor. Give him glory. God says, no, 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 no. When you call on me, when you say, God, I need you. God, I can't make this day without you. God, I can't even make up my bed without you. God, I can't get on the highway without you. God, I'm not going to step foot in my job unless you go with me. God says, you literally honor me. i got a few more minutes left, so I guess I'll give you the second part of what you need to hear from God. Is that all right? Second thing I'll give you, and I'll stop with this. We'll see how far time allows us to go. Prayer should be accompanied by periods of fasting. I, I want to complete the assignment that your pastor gave me. He said, teach on prayer and hearing from God. If you're going to hear from God, Number one, you have to understand how important prayer is. But then secondly, prayer should be accompanied by periods of fasting. Let me show you this principle. Matthew 10 and verse 1, here's what happens. Jesus calls his 12 disciples to, to him and he gives them the authority to drive out impure spirits, heal every disease and sickness. 
He gives them the authority to do it. Drop down seven chapters later in Matthew 17 and verse 14. This is when this man who's demon possessed brings his son to the disciples and they couldn't drive him out. Jesus comes down the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And he's wondering what all of the commotion is about. And it says, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on your son. For he is an epileptic and suffers severely for he often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. That's a problem because just seven chapters earlier, Jesus says, I've given you the authority. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. He deals with that, and then the disciples come to him privately and say, now, we're, we're a little confused. Why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, or surely I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you say this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Translation, there are some levels of breakthrough, some dimensions of glory that won't just happen by virtue of prayer. You've got to marry prayer with fasting. I don't know who this is for tonight, but I want you to hear this. Fasting is the secret key that unlocks heaven's doors like never before. Fasting is one of the keys that will release the anointing of God and the favor of God and the blessings of God in your life and on your life and through your life like never before. This is a part of what Jesus is talking about in our key verse in Matthew 5 and 6 in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Translation, you are blessed when you hunger for God more than anything else. That's what fasting is about. He says, you shall be filled. And I don't know, maybe this is for just a few of you. Maybe it's for those that are watching online, but I, I, I believe that some of you sense that there is something else that God desires to release in your life. Some of you sense that there, that there, is, there, there is greater, and for some of you, you can't even adequately articulate it. There is a stirring in your soul. There, there deep down in, the, in your belly, there's something that you sense that God wants you to give birth to. Some of you are in a season and in a place where what you need desperately is, is an unprecedented move from God. And why I'm here teaching on prayer and fasting is because I want you to understand that fasting will position you for these things to happen when you combine it with prayer. I got three amens right there. We are talking about prayer and hearing from God, aren't we? I, I know, I know. This is why a lot of people don't preach on fasting because it's not popular. But yet again, we wonder why there's no power. F fasting is not a diet. This is not what you're going to do to be like Stella to go on, you know, your summer break and get your groove back. Fasting is not a diet. Fasting is abstaining from foods and other things for a period of time because you hunger for God more. Okay, okay. I think I got to give you, give you a little bit more substantial biblical evidence. So if you're taking notes, I want to give you two quick things. Number one, fasting is indispensable for greater breakthrough. This may only be for a few of you that, that, that something leaped in your spirit when I started talking about the greater that you're sensing. Fasting is indispensable for greater breakthrough. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4 and 12, many of you may know this verse. It says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. It goes on and says, a cord of three strands is not quickly, easily broken. A lot of times we think that this verse is about community and about making sure that you got the right kind of people in your life. And, and that's not all that this verse is speaking to. Uh, beyond the need for community, this verse is also pointing to the three duties of every believer. In fact, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about these three kingdom duties. Some of you are still not with me. Let me break it down. Matthew 6, Matthew 6, get there really quickly. Matthew 6, I don't have time to unpack the whole uh, chapter of Matthew 6, but in Matthew 6, Jesus is talking about these three kingdom duties. 
He, he says, and, and so when you give, and, and I won't read all of those verses, but he goes on and, and talks about when you give, this is how you're supposed to give. Then you drop down to verse 5, and he says, and when you pray, right? Then he gives instructions. When you pray, this is how you're supposed to pray. And then you get down to verse 16, he says, and when you fast. He says, when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces, meaning you don't have to tell everybody, I'm, you know, I wish I could go out to lunch with you today, boo, but I can't because I'm fast. And you don't have to do all of that. He says, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but when you fast, put all on your head, wash your face. That means you look good, you smell good, so it won't be obvious to others that you are fasting. But only to your father who is unseen, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So let me unpack that. Matthew 6, Jesus says, when you give, when you pray and when you fast, three kingdom duties, giving, praying, and fasting, should be a normal part of the believer's life. So now let's go back to Ecclesiastes. When Solomon says a cord of three strands is not easily broken, he's pointing to those three kingdom duties, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. You missed it. Okay. Without those three kingdom duties, we often miss the greater breakthrough that God wants to bring in our lives because often we don't do one of the three. And Jesus deals with the impact of, your, of the breakthrough when you start picking and choosing. I'm going to do one or maybe I'm not going to do any. And he deals with the impact in Mark 4 and 8 when he starts talking about the parable of the sower. Once again, I don't have time to unpack all of that, but he says other seed fell on good soil. It came up grew and produce a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, and 100 times. Others, like the seed, this is verse 20, sown on the good soil. This is when he's explaining the parable to the disciples. He says, others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word accepted and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what is sown. Am I going too fast? I'm looking at that clock. I'm trying to run. So Jesus is once again talking about this greater breakthrough. Watch this. So that when you just give, you position yourself for a 30-fold return. But when you pray, when you give, meaning you pray and give, two habits in your life, you position yourself for a 60-fold return. But when all three duties are active in the believer's life, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast, you set yourself up for a hundredfold return. Touch somebody and say, I want a hundredfold kind of breakthrough. So what am I trying to teach you? So many of us miss the greater breakthrough because we've just been content to live with maybe a 30-fold kind of return. Maybe we give a little bit. Or maybe we pray a little bit and maybe you go beyond just giving and so you have a 60-fold return. But the last time I checked in school, 60 is still failing. Could this be why some of the blessings that we've been waiting on has yet to be released in our life? Could it be why there are some prayers that have yet to be answered? Could it be that this is why some addictions and some strongholds have yet to be broken? Touch somebody and tell them, I got to have fasting to my life. I want that greater breakthrough. Uh, I, got, I got a few more minutes. Fasting is indispensable for the greater breakthrough. Here's the second point. Your stomach is often the biggest stumbling block. I, you're going to get real quiet on me right here. I'm not going to get any amens, no. I'm not going to get anything, so I've already come prepared. Thank you, Holy Spirit. See, see, the biggest reason why fasting is often overlooked, why there are not a lot of individuals that preach and teach about it, is because the truth of the matter is for an overwhelming amount of people, particularly believers, our stomach is really our king. 
So many people won't fast. They won't receive the kind of breakthrough that I was just talking about because the truth of the matter is we are controlled by our stomachs. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan, the first way that Satan comes at Jesus, turn these stones to bread? Are you following me? And Jesus goes on, this is Luke 4, I don't have time to take you through it, but he literally says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He's literally saying, I'm hungering for more than what my stomach wants. I, I told you we're not going to get a lot of amens right up in through here. You were just shouting about the breakthrough. For so many people, listen to me, our stomach is the king of our life. What do you mean, Bishop? Well, this is part of the reason why it is said that a way to a man's heart <laughs> is through his stomach. Think, think about that for a second. Not a way to a man's heart is his heart. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Why is that a common saying? Because for so many people, our stomach is the king of our lives. Watch this. And not only do mothers know this, Satan does as well. Let's go back and check the record. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. Then God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and he put the man in it that he had just made. He made all kinds of trees grow from the ground. Trees beautiful to look at, good to eat. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Drop down to verse 16, God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. That's how the message translates it. The message translation translates it. That, that, that seems simple enough, right? You can eat from any tree, just don't eat from that one. Simple, I got it. Everything else I can eat, I just can't eat from that tree. Seems simple, but we know what happened, don't we? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. So let's put it into context. Because of one meal, Adam and Eve went from enjoying the presence of God to ultimately hiding from him. They, they literally ate themselves out of house and home. They ate themselves out of the will of God. They ate themselves out of the plan and the provision of God. Their stomach was happy, but God was not. I'm teaching better than you're responding. So, so Bible study, Bible study. How many of you have heard that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their perversity? Be honest with me. How many of you heard that through the grapevine? Right? Some of you are like, uh, uh, no, put your hand up if, if, you, if you heard that. It's all right to say I heard that. I did too growing up. But then I got into the word of God, particularly in the book of Ezekiel, and I found out that there was literally more to the story. In Ezekiel 16, beginning at verse 49, it says this, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, let's call it a roll, overfed and unconcerned they did not help the poor and the needy they were haughty and did detestable things before me therefore I did away with them as you have seen let me break that down God says they were arrogant that means nobody could tell them anything when you when you think that you're the best thing since sliced bread and you cannot learn from anybody that's arrogance. But then he says they were unconcerned. Unconcerned means they did not pray. He goes on and says that they did not help the poor and the needy. Watch this. That means they did not give. And then he says they were overfed. Their excessive loyalty to their stomach. Let me say it another way. Their appetites carry them to their destruction. What are you trying to teach us, Bishop? The same thing is happening today. Marriages are falling apart because somebody can't control their appetites. 
Parents are losing the respect of their children because they cannot control their appetites. People with so much promise and potential are crashing and burning because they cannot control their appetites. Look at somebody and tell them, I got to get my appetite under control. I want, I want God more than the stuff that my stomach is craving. I, I, I want to I push you, new birth, to get to a place where you hunger for God more, more, than, more, more than fried chicken, more, more, more than more, whatever your favorite meal is. I want you to get to a place where you hunger for God more than your favorite show, more than your favorite pastime. I, I know that Atlanta, my hometown, has got a lot to do, but I want to push you to hopefully hope that you get to a place where you hunger for God more than anything else like David said as a deer pants for water so my soul is thirsty for you this is Bible study so let's go to Genesis 25 verse 39 I want you to see the tragedy giving away the greater breakthrough because your appetites are not under control. Genesis 25 and verse 29 says, one, one day Jacob was cooking a stew. And Esau came in from the field starved. Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that red stew. I'm starved. That's how he became called Edom, red. Jacob said, well now, um, make a trade. My stew for your rights as the firstborn. Esau said, man, I'm starving. What good is a birthright if I'm dead? Jacob said, well, first swear to me, and he did it. On oath, Esau traded away his rights as the firstborn. Jacob gave him bread and the stew of lentils. He ate and drank and got up and left, and that's how Esau, watch this, shrugged off his rights. Translation, gave away his breakthrough. He sold his blessing. He sold his birthright because his stomach controlled him. Now, some of you are familiar with that story, but let's put it into context. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. The writer of Hebrews says, here's the thing. Watch out for the Esau syndrome. That by itself is enough to say, wait a minute, God, what are you saying? God says, watch out for the Esau syndrome. What is the Esau syndrome? Trading away... God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. Lord, have mercy. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But watch this. But by then, it was too late. Tears or no tears. Look at somebody and tell them, watch out for the Esau syndrome. Look at somebody else and tell them what God has for you is too great for you to give away because you got a short-term appetite. God's blessing is too important for you to sacrifice on the altar of a short-term appetite. They don't even deserve it. It's not going to be worth it. Don't give away your blessing and your birthright for a short-term appetite. Find out how to fall on your knees and pray and say, Lord, help take this thing away from me because what you have for me is too important for me to sacrifice it on the altar of a short term. Woo! God, I hear you. I got a minute left. Let me close with this. I want you to understand new birth. I heard your pastor when he was starting this series, talked about, he, he talked about how when you really understand the power of prayer and, and when you have good devotional time, prayer time, when you make it a habit and it's primary in your life, I, I heard Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant saying that then Sunday morning becomes the after party. The reason I believe that God wanted me to share this with you in this series is because as I close, I, I just want you to sense it. And, and I pray that let he or she who has an ear hear what the Spirit of God is saying to this house. Prayer and fasting will bring you closer to God and it will change things. Maybe this message tonight, this teaching, 
is only for the people that really desire to hear from God. If you just want an ordinary, regular, run-of-the-mill, routine relationship, this is not for you. But if you're hungry to encounter God in a fresh new way, prayer and fasting will do it. You know, one of the things that I've learned is that part of the reason why God honors prayer and fasting the way that he does, part of the reason why prayer and fasting is one of the most powerful forms of worship is because it involves sacrifice. If, if you're going to carve out daily time with God, if you are going to push your plate away or turn the television off or turn the radio off to, to fast from other things that, that are creature comforts just because you hunger for God to that degree. It, it is perceived by God as worship because there's sacrifice in it. And I want you to understand that, that a part of, of what worship does, what sacrifice does, is it captures God's attention. And God begins to reveal more of himself because he says, if you cared enough about me to sacrifice other stuff, then I've got to reveal my glory in a fresh way. You do remember that, that Abraham finds out that God is a provider only because he's willing to give a sacrifice. I thought I had some amens right there. You do remember when God tells Abraham, you take Isaac, your son, your only son, to, to that mountain and you sacrifice him there. And it's interesting to me that Abraham says, when they get to the, to the mountain, the foot of the mountain, he says, he says to the, to, the, to the servants that went with them on part of the journey, he says, y'all stay here with the donkeys. I don't even have time to deal with that. Some people can only stay with the a assets. The donkeys. He says, why me and the boy, we're going over there to worship. And then we're coming back to you. And you know, some of you know the story that he gets to the top. Isaac says, Dad, I see, see the wood, check. See, see the fire, check. But where is the sacrifice? And his father says, the Lord, watch this, will provide. And he puts Isaac on the altar and gets ready to slay him. And the angel of the Lord says, don't you, don't you, don't you, don't you put your hand on that boy. God says, now, now I know. It was just a test. It, it, it was just a test. Genesis 22 even opens up that way. It was just a test. I just wanted to know what's more important to you. I just wanted to know, is the stuff that I gave you more important to you or me, the one who gave it to you, is that more important to you? I, I just wanted to know, I know you're blessed, I know you got the car, I know you got the house, but, but I want to know, what's more important to you, the blessing or the blessor? He says, so I, I brought you to this test because I just wanted to know, would you be willing to sacrifice anything for me? And here's the thing, the only way that that ram could have been in the bush at the exact moment when he got ready to slay his son. The only way that that ram could have been there at that exact moment when he put Isaac on the altar and got ready. The only way that the ram could have been there at that exact moment is that while Abraham and Isaac were going up one side of the mountain, God had already providentially ordained it that the ram would be coming up the other side of the mountain. What am I trying to tell you? When God knows that your heart is that, that, that God, I'll sacrifice whatever you need because I love you that much. He's already ordained that what you need is coming up the other side of the mountain. He just wanted to know, 
will you sacrifice for me? And I don't know who this is for, but God's got something greater coming up the other side of the mountain. High five somebody, tell them something greater is coming. Something bigger is coming. But God wants to know, are you willing? Are, are you willing to sacrifice your time? Are you willing to sacrifice the creature comforts? Are, are you willing to tell your friends, I can't hang out with you tonight because I got an appointment with my daddy? Are, are you willing to say, I, I can't watch the season finale of my favorite show. I'll TiVo it and get to it. There's another show that God is producing. It's the show of my life. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to, to lay on the altar? <laughs> what are you willing to say, God, I, I thank you for it. I maybe even remember when I prayed and asked you to do it, but that's not more important than you. It's not more important than, than me and you going to the next place in our relationship. And, and if this is what it takes, I'll lay it all. Ooh, God, I don't know who this is for, but if this is your word, just right where you are, I want to just ask you to get in whatever posture you want to get in, to pray or praise. And the uh, Spirit of the Lord is in this place, and I believe we ought to just lean into it. Just lean into it. Somebody is here tonight, and this is the answer to some of the questions you've been lifting up to God. God, when? God, why? God, what are you doing? Hey. Hallelujah. Maybe you need to just make an altar right where you are. Maybe you need to come to this altar, but the Spirit of God is in this place. What is the Lord saying to you? Have you fallen more in love with what he's given you? Have you allowed the things that he blessed you with to dictate and determine your life? When is the last time you set an appointment and said, God, I, I got to see you? Hey. Thank you, Lord. Hey. Mm. We want to see you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hey. We want to see you, Jesus. Yes. We need you, Jesus. Can't live without hey. you, Lord. Hey. We need your presence, Lord. Yes. We need to see you. Yes, Lord. We need to see you. Yes, 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 yes. We need to see you. Yes, Lord. Yes, we need to see you. We need to see you, Jesus. We need to see you. We need to see. We need to see you. Yes. And all of your glory, Lord. We need to see you. On our jobs, we need to we see need you. To see you. In our country, we need to see you. We Communities, we need to see you, God. We need to see you, Jesus. In our schools, we need to see you. Oh, we need to see you. We need to see you. Yes. Just settle here with us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Settle here with us, Jesus. We need to see you. We need to see you.
church. Settle down, yeah. Settle down. Hey. Seem throw your own weight around. Throw your own weight around. Because we need your glory. We need your glory. Come on. Settle down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At this time, we would like to open up the altar for anyone who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to experience the King. I ask that everyone pray that this word touch the hearts of the people. John chapter 14, the words of the Lord Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go and I'm preparing a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you can be also. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is your moment. Now is your chance. Now is your moment. Now is your chance. The altar is open. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second call today is for anyone that wants to rededicate their life to Christ you might be saved but this word challenged you tonight and you want to make a public declaration that I'm gonna pray I'm gonna fast I'm gonna give I'm gonna serve Jesus with all of my heart you might be saved but if you're in the room tonight you want to make a public declaration make a statement and step out on faith the altar is open for you tonight T touch now Lord Come on, I believe if we create an atmosphere, I want to recommit myself to prayer. I want to recommit myself to fasting. I want to recommit myself. We need to see a wonder. Hallelujah. Well, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord, I thank you 
for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe you're coming again and I receive you in my heart. If you prayed that prayer of faith, you are saved. Come on, if you're at home and you prayed that prayer, you are saved. Over the last six months, our church has been doing some awesome things, and it is because we have an awesome pastor. That's a place to put your hands together. Amen. Our pastor has done more in the past six months than people have done in their entire ministry, reshaping Atlanta and reshaping the nation. We want to open up the doors of the church and extend an invitation for you to make New Birth your home, for you to make Pastor Jamal Bryant your pastor. You need a place to be connected, to receive the word of God. If you're at home, we're, we're challenging you to meet us here on Sunday morning and hear a word from our pastor. The doors of the church are open. Is anyone, everyone saved? Everyone has a church home? Come on, New Birth, we want you to reach out. If there's somebody you don't know on your left or your right, we want you to ask him, are you saved? Do you have a church home? Amen? Well, if all hearts and minds are clear, come on, let's shout that everybody is saved. Come on, let's rejoice that everyone is saved. Praise God. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord for the word we received tonight. Was that not a rich word from God on prayer and fasting? Can we thank God again for the messenger that God used to deliver our mail tonight? Bless the Lord for Bishop Dr. Van Moody. Amen. Amen. Take your seats, if you will, for a moment. This night would not be complete without two things. We want to hear the voice of the man of God who speaks over us all the time. He sent us a message, new birth. So we want to hear a quick message from our pastor on his birthday. Would you please watch this? One of my favorite shows is The First 48. Had no idea it was my life story till I woke up and realized I've just circled the moon 48 times. Newberg, thank you so much for overwhelming me with love, affection, and support. This is the best year ever. I'm not getting older. I'm getting better. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Well, as our pastor celebrates his birthday, uh, we want to give a good report to him that we were here. We were in the house. We were connected tonight by live stream. We got the word. We're going to put it in practice. And we heard tonight that there is a trilogy that God is looking for. Matthew 6 said, when you give, when you pray and when you fast. We have an opportunity right now, New Birth, to participate in the trilogy. It is time for us to give. It's offering time in the house of the Lord. You wonder why do they get excited? We get excited because we don't have to give. We don't have to give anything. But God has so richly blessed us. God has put things in our path. He has put blessings in our way. He's given us jobs. He's given us checks. He's given us inheritances. He's given us resources. He's given us just payouts that have come. He's given us lawsuits that just worked in our favor. He's given people things that they didn't even know was coming. And when we get to the house of God, we just have to go down in our treasure and give God back to him what belongs to him. 10% belongs off the top. That's the tithe, God. We're bringing it cheerfully tonight. We give our offering saying, God, we just want to bless you in the house of God. Tonight, let's have 100% giving. We want everybody to sow into the work of God tonight. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand. Our ushers will serve you. If you're watching tonight by live stream or you're here in the sanctuary and you want to give by technological means, just go to Push Pay. Look for New Birth. You'll find us, New Birth Atlanta. You can go to Givelify 
or you can go to the cash app dollar sign love live lead or just go on to the website and you'll find a way to give now however you're giving tonight whether by cash by check uh, out of the goodness of your heart and out of the blessings of the Lord we're going to sow tonight our tithe our offering and if you didn't have an opportunity yet to give our pastor a birthday present it's not too late you can sow a birthday gift into his life on the envelope just indicate how much you are allocating for our birthday gift for Pastor Brian and he'd be glad to receive that as well uh, so let's be cheerful and let's be generous in our giving tonight whether we're here or whether we're watching we are one and we participate in the whole service from the beginning to the end so new birth if you have your offering ready would you stand to your feet please we're going to sew together cheerfully. If your neighbor doesn't have anything, uh, just go ahead and nudge them and put something in their hand. Tell them this one's for you. God's blessed me to the point of overflow. I've got one here for you. Make sure everybody is participating as you uh, will. We're going to sew cheerfully together. Lift that offering to the Lord and tell the Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. All right, as the worship team uh, gives us some moving music, if you'd like to come to the altar, come quickly to the altar or place it in the basket as it passes your road. tonight we're going to ask our guest speaker if he would come and give us our closing prayer once again we want to bless God for uh, the presence of the Lord here in the house of God tonight come on give God the greatest praise we thank God tonight for our pastor Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant one more time happy birthday sir and we want to thank God for the blessing that has been given to us in Bishop Van Moody and his wife Dr. Ty Moody Our Father and our God, we thank you for what you've spoken on tonight. And our prayer is simple. Let it not just be tantalizing and entertaining. But God, allow us now to put feet to our faith and to walk it out. Let us be hearers and doers. Let us move from 30 and 60 into the place of a hundredfold. God, I pray that you stir up in new birth. A hunger for you that supersedes everything else and I thank you by faith for the greater that is coming up the other side that you've already ordained we bless you now in the mighty name of Jesus amen hug somebody on your way out tell them we'll see you on Sunday <laughs>